Welcome everybody to Beyond the Shadows. I'm author and ghost historian Mike Ricksecker. We have a great show up for you tonight. Very interesting, maybe controversial. We're going to be getting into Project Blue Book. Yes, that uh, government project from the 1950s and 60s that researched UFO reports. So there is that show out there right now on History Channel of the same name, Project Blue Book, that... Um, it's, it's an interesting take on it, we'll say that. So it's a uh, dramatization. There are, it's based on the real, uh, the real cases, some of the real people, not all. <laughs> and um, you know, basically, it's like a, it's an X-Files that takes place in the 1950s. So we'll get into a little bit of all of that stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, those that came in from the Chakra show that was on... Uh, Edge of the Rabbit Hole, thank you very much for joining this. That was a uh, really interesting episode with Nicole Guillaume, so I do encourage you to check that out if you missed it after this. So, um, All right, so Project Blue Book, what in the world was this? So this was the uh, government's way of, uh, it started in 1952, this was the government's way of researching UFO reports, basically to try to... Uh, debunk them you know they they wanted uh some guys to go out there uh put together logical explanations as to uh what these sightings were you know something uh real world not aliens and um you know to kind of appease the people um it in 1952 there was like a they call it the flap there was a massive rise in uh ufo reports and sightings especially over washington dc uh we'll get a, a little bit of that as well so um, the name that you'll recognize, of course, is uh, J. Allen Hynek, which is the main character on the show right now. And he was he was involved from the very beginning, even before Project Blue Book. And um, so we'll throw a little history out here at you guys. And then, of course, if you have any questions, throw them down in there. And we'll answer them to the best of our ability. We'll do some call in later, too. Um, so. It all it started actually um, with Project Sign, and this came out of 1947. So you're talking Roswell. There's actually a little bit of stuff before Roswell. So the um, the sighting by Kenneth Arnold in June 1947, just before Roswell, um, in the Cascade Mountains, Mount Rainier, that area, Washington State, uh, and he he's basically the guy that kind of coined the term. Uh, flying saucers because he basically said it looked like a a saucer skipping across the water the way it moved and so um, prior to that point um, there were a lot of different terms people were using for these things that they were seeing in the sky um, some of my research that I did in the 1920s uh, for a haunted location have had nothing to do with UFOs um, one of the observances from that particular location was what they called a twinkler in the sky um, but basically it was a UFO report so 1947 is kind of like really when things kind of took off so there's that there's Roswell there's some other things going on in California and so um, the Air Force which was newly formed that year came out of the old Army Air Corps um, one of their first projects that they put together was project sign and this was to kind of like do the same sort of stuff as project blue book and look into these different reports that were going on um so that was 1947 and jay allen hynek was involved with that as well so he's involved from the very beginning um later on 1949 it became project grudge and then in uh when grudge was done in 51 in 1952 it became project blue book um so that's kind of the uh, the quick background. Um, the other one that was really involved was uh, Captain Edward uh, Ruppelt. And you're watching the show, um, basically that Captain Quinn is kind of the stand-in for Captain Ruppelt. So um, he was the one that pretty much ran the show at Project Blue Book. He was the main guy. Now, there are several people that were involved. You know, the, the show that's out there right now basically shows two guys and then the generals. Um, but, but there were a lot of people that were involved with this thing. And, um, yeah, Rupel is basically the guy that Quinn is depicting on the show, if you're following that. And what's, what's interesting is, um, you know, on the, on the television show, they're basically having Heineck come up with the term UFO, 
uh, where it was actually Ruppelt in real life, not Heineck that came up with it. Um, what's interesting about that is um, even though he came up with the term UFO, Ruppelt didn't call it UFO. He called it UFO. <laughs> so he just pronounced the whole the whole thing as a word rather than each individual letter. So um, kind of interesting stuff. Uh, Tim Schoen wants me to do the Hunter Road Roast. So we'll do that real quick. So there we go. This episode of Beyond the Shadows brought to you by Hunter Road Roast. It helps young ghosts. There you go. <laughs> I should probably do that at the very beginning, right? So... Um, so I see some references down there to X Files and stuff like that. Yeah, it 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 basically is like an X Files. It goes back to the the in the nineteen fifties is kind of the way that the show was playing. Um, so I mentioned that you know it's not Heineck that came up with the term um, UFO. It's actually Ruppelt, but Heineck did come up with the different types of close encounters. Uh, at least the first three, and after uh, after him, people have come up with like fourth, fifth, sixth you know, different variations of the, of the close encounters. So like number one would be, um, you know, seeing something up in the sky. Um, yeah. Number two would be like a, um, oh, like a little bit of a, uh, interaction, like hearing, um, you know, some sounds come from it and, and things like that. Um, three would be, you actually see the alien, uh, sort of stuff. So there's a three different, uh, those three different close encounters, and um, and Tammy, no, Shauna's not with me because it's it's an alien thing. She doesn't really do that. So, um, Betty Lange, didn't the public report sightings before 1945? Um, yeah, the public has been reporting sightings for um, really thousands of years. You know, there's the ancient alien guys will say, hey, you know, here's different evidence of of uh, reports of different aliens, but um, or extraterrestrials or whatever you want to call them, but um, yeah, all throughout history, there's there's been reports um, of different sightings. The one that I was referencing earlier, that Twinkler, that was like 1921, 1922. Um, there's other ones that you'll, uh, you can research and find out about from like the late 1800s if you're trying to get to like a more of a modern era uh, before, or not before, but um, you know after what the ancient alien guys would uh, consider ancient, so... Um, but yeah, there's, um, you know, plenty of stuff throughout the ages that, uh, do seem to refer to sightings of extraterrestrials, things in the sky, stuff like that. So, um, so Robert Hanna is asking battle of Los Angeles. What do I think happened? Um, yeah, I, I think it was. I think Battle of Los Angeles is really what a lot of the conspiracy theorists think it was. I think they were shooting up there at a, um, you know, at a UFO, at an unidentified flying object. And, you know, there's too many civilian reports of um, what people believe was something unidentified that they were, you know, trying to fire upon. It's too big of an incident and, you know, the military and what we see with Project Blue Book is, you know, they try to excuse everything away um, no matter what it is. They kind of have this uh, mentality of, you know, especially with the, the Project Blue Book stuff, um, um, if it can't be or it can't be, therefore it isn't. So in other words, um, given our ideas of the way technology works um you know it's it doesn't work like that you know how how people see these different crafts um make these different you know crazy turns you know like in the midair that just like defy gravity defy physics the way we know it um you know it it, it couldn't be in an airplane because of the way it moved and the g-forces would just like kill a person um so it just you know, because we can't, you know, logically come up with it with the way we know the universe works. Well, it just simply can't be, you know, you um, either it's a hoax or, um, you know, you, you hallucinated it or something like that. I tend to find an excuse just to poo poo the thing away. Um, when Heine came into it, he was a complete skeptic of uh, 
of the UFO phenomenon. He, uh, he didn't believe in it. And over the course of time, um, he basically grew to realize that, hey, while a lot of these reports are, you can come up with a reason for it. You know, there are 13,000, almost 13,000 reports that Project Blue Book dealt with. Um, there's only 700 that are unexplained. But think about it. There's 700 that are unexplained that they were never able to uh, come up with a logical explanation for. And, um, you know, he started realizing over the years that, you know, there's there's too much still in question. And the Air Force was just too quick to try to dismiss, 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 dismiss. Um, they, you know, they wanted these guys, Project Blue Book, to go in there, find a logical explanation for it or assign a logical explanation and, you know, we'll go about our business. Um, you know, some of it could have been like government testing and, and what have you. You know, maybe that's why. There's a lot of uh, speculation about that. And we do know the, go the government was doing a lot of different testing. Uh, but then there's other things that, you know, still defy explanation. So um, let's see what you guys have for other questions down here. Um so Victoria Monday asking, do all cultures have UFO stories? I mean, you, it's a good question. So um, most, if not all cultures, have stories about higher beings. And you could say a lot of it has to do with their religion or their belief system. Um, you could say, based on some of what their... Um, you know, the way they describe their uh, higher power or what have you, and this goes down the ancient aliens route, you know, perhaps those were some sort of extraterrestrial and not necessarily a quote-unquote God. So you could say that all cultures have that belief system in there if you think that their gods were actually extraterrestrials and not like a uh, spiritual being. Um, some of the reports that... Um, the Project Blue Book dealt with uh, did come in from uh, other countries. So, you know, it, it wasn't just, you know, the United States that dealt with this stuff. So they dealt with it in other countries too. Plus, you know, just other countries around the world have their own stuff going on. Um, you know, uh, like the UK had their own division that was kind of similar to Project Blue Book that, that dealt with that. And like, you know, Nick Pope dealt uh, was one of those guys that was in that you know, taking the different uh, UFO reports and seeing how they might be able to follow up on it. Um, Tammy Heitzman saying, you know, way too many reports of aliens for there not to be truth to it. Um, yeah, it's, um, and that's kind of the thing, is like there's so many, so many, so many, and they're not able to explain everything. So if they can't explain it, then, you know, what do we think it is? Um, I know skeptics will say, well, we just don't have an explanation yet, but it can't be, it can't be extraterrestrial. It's kind of like with the paranormal. Well, I don't have an explanation for it yet, but it can't be a ghost because I just, I don't believe in ghosts. Well, <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's kind of one of those things that I guess people want to see it before they believe it. But, you know, I go to the store and buy a candy bar and I believe that there's a candy bar inside the wrapper. You know, I don't know for sure because I haven't opened it up yet, but, um, you know, when I open it, it it's it's going to be a candy bar. So. <laughs> um, Tim Schoen, do you think that the phenomenon of missing time that Bud Hopkins investigated is tied to UFO sightings, alien abductions? Uh, it could be. Um, it, it very well could be. We talk about time displacement in a lot of different arenas. Uh, whether it's with extraterrestrials or interdimensional beings or just even with the way the universe works. So, um, you know, people will try to link the uh, missing time to alien abductions that, you know, they've been taken away somewhere and they don't remember it and then they're brought back to Earth and it just, it's like a blackout, you know. Um, so it could be, you know, I'm not ruling it out. Um... Tom McNicholas, do you think Bigfoot was alien? I have a hard time with that one. I have a hard time with that one. Uh, we had Ken Gerhardt on Edge of the Rabbit Hole um, a few months ago, and 
that was a that was a question that was thrown his way, and he's you know kind of one of the foremost guys uh, researching that type of activity and that type of phenomenon, and um, and you know he thinks that they're you know, indigenous to uh, you know to the land that they're here, that they're in such small numbers. You know, you think about it, even if they estimate like maybe a couple thousand, I guess. I'm not exactly sure how they get the estimate, but, you know, they estimate a couple thousand. And given like the sheer mass of land that's there, it's easier for a couple thousand, you know, beings to to hide themselves. So, um, but yeah, I mean, people, people do speculate, you know, whether they're some sort of alien or interdimensional being or, you know, some, you know, something like that. So, um, uh, Pam Presnell, I've seen three UFOs over the past 45 years. Can't say they were alien, but they, uh, but can't say they weren't either. And that's kind of the thing. So, um, is that an unidentified flying object doesn't necessarily have to be extraterrestrial. It just means something in the air that's flying that we haven't been able to identify. Um, so, that, that's an interesting thing about Project Blue Book is that your 700, I think it's 701, um, unidentifieds there are, they're, they are UFOs because they've unidentified, they were flying in their objects, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they were alien or extraterrestrial in nature. It just means they haven't been identified yet. Um, so there are some compelling arguments, of course, for many of these those reports to possibly be something extraterrestrial or interstellar or something like that. Um, others, maybe not so much, but um, they would be technically considered a UFO. So, um, Victoria Monday, why is there so much UFO activity over Vegas now? Well, it seems like it has been for a while. I don't know if it's so much just now, but it, it has been. Um, don't know if that has to do with maybe the aridness of the area, you know, it's, uh, fairly remote, uh, maybe it has to do with some of those things. Um, you know, some people speculate that, well, you know, they're, these extraterrestrials are working with the United States military and that's where, you know, the U S military would like to work with them at, or at least establish relationships there, uh, with them at, at those areas. So there's a lot of different possibilities as to why that could be. So, um, what else do I want to hit on here? So I kind of gave you guys the, um, um, kind of a rundown of the history of, of Project Blue Book and kind of where that originated and what happened. It ended in 1969. Um, so it had a pretty good run and the, the end of it basically was, you know, the, the Conlon report came out and, and basically said in summary that there wasn't, um, really any reason, a worthwhile reason to keep pursuing um, the the research into UFOs. Um, but the interesting thing about that is it's essentially the, the summary from Conlon. But if you look into the actual details of the report, there were many of the cases that they looked into that they couldn't identify. I think it was like a third of the ones that they actually selected for uh, for the for the research for that report, that the team couldn't actually identify. So even though Conlon in his summary is saying, "Yeah, there's no reason to keep pursuing this," um, th- there was a third of them that they couldn't identify in their own project, and that's that's kind of something that doesn't really ever get uh, talked about. <laughs> so you know, it's it's interesting how they kept trying to sweep things under the rug, keep sweeping things under the rug because they didn't. They didn't want the public to really take notice. They wanted to keep giving the public a some sort of excuse, um, you know, to not keep looking at this different phenomenon that was going on. But it's there. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's great with the different um, the different shows that have been coming out lately, trying to divulge this information uh, because it was hidden from us for so long. Um, you know, Hollywood tried to give us pieces of it, like Close Encounters of the Third Kind. In fact, Jay, Jay Allen Hynek was actually, uh, he had a cameo in that. Um, you know, when the saucer comes down and everybody's, you know, taking a look, they have a, uh, a nice close-up close of him. 
So Hollywood was kind of giving you pieces of it here and there, here and there. And, you know, now um, with some of the different shows that have come out, some of the proliferation over the Internet, uh, we're starting to get more and more of that information and, and documents are being released. You know, there's the, um, you know, when the uh, everything happened with the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, back in the 70s, you know, some of that information was divulged. And it's like, even though for years the government had been saying, yep, nothing here, nothing to look at here, actually was there. So we know they've been lying to us for a long, long time. Um, so Betty Lange, is Project Blue Book finished now or does the government have a new code name? So, um, so Project Blue Book, yeah, that was finished in 1969. Um, there are different, so there's no official uh, government program that looks into UFO phenomena. There's There are different government programs that are um, working on researching to see if there's other life uh, in the cosmos, um, but they... If they do have an official UFO program, they're not admitting it. Um, some people think that, you know, it's kind of you know, cloak and dagger stuff that, you know, there is something going on behind the scenes there uh, that they're not willing to admit to right now. But, of course, that's speculation and conjecture. Um, so, Mike, you think the missing 401 stories of people vanishing in the national parks and never seen again are extraterrestrial or interdimensional related? Um it's a good question. I think it's a mix of a lot of different things. Um, you know, people do try to go to the, uh, you know, interdimensional or extraterrestrial route. It could be. I mean, we really don't know. You know, are these people getting abducted? You know, are they slipping into a portal, never be seen again? You know, people do believe that because they'll be like walking alongside people and just talking. And all of a sudden the person's gone. You know, or, you know, they just need to tie their shoe for a second. And again, they're, boom, they're gone. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's really kind of strange. But yet, you know, I think, I do think a lot of these people are just getting lost in the woods. And it might seem a little strange because it's like, well, if they were just there and then they're just gone. But the woods will swallow you up really quick. And I used, I used to live near the woods and, you know, even though you know it pretty well, um, you can get turned around and lost pretty quickly out there. And you'll hear sometimes reports of people that, that do get found, um, you know, after several days that had to survive out there that, you know, and it's, it's the same type of story where, you know, they were on the path, they were just there and, you know, their family or friends or whatever turned around and the person was gone and, you know, they do get found several days later and they kind of explain, yeah, I just got turned around, lost off the path or, you know, heard something and want to check it out real quick. And I thought I would, ju I would be just a minute and they couldn't, couldn't find their way back. So I do believe some of it is just physical people getting lost in the woods. Um, probably not a popular idea, but it does happen. Um, so, Betty Lane, Contact was a good movie. Yep, yep, that was. Um, yeah, where's the real X-Files team where you need it? Yeah, exactly. So, Victoria Monday, Space Force being created because they're trying to prep us for contact to quell the panic. Um, maybe, maybe. I mean, there was the, uh, the Brookings report that was released a long time ago that... Um, basically stated that if you know, if it was revealed that there were aliens extraterrestrials and even if you know they were among us um that there would be a crisis that um basically people would lose their shit and so people look at to or look to the brookings report to say well this is why they've been withholding things from us is because they believe if they tell us the truth then there's going to be a you know, massive panic uh, all over the world. I don't subscribe to that. I, I've never believed that. Um, I think, you know, there's some initial shock and all, like, oh, but I don't, I, I can't imagine there being some crazy panic over the thing. I just don't. Um, 
I think, you know, for most people who just click like, oh yeah, well, I mean, shit, you know, how many billions of planets are there out there? Trillions? It's more than that. Um, you know, the rest of the universe has had, you know, nine billion more years than us to get ahead of us. I'm sure there are space travelers out there, you know, so it, it's inevitable. Um, but there is this idea that, you know, they have been for years kind of grooming us and letting things into the mainstream, letting things into our popular culture, you know, to kind of groom us for the eventual announcement that, yeah, you know, we're not alone in the universe. Um, but I've never believed that we would have freaked out to begin with. I mean, some people would have, but, you know, you get that in any situation. You'll have people suddenly freak out. I mean, you know, they announce that there's going to be, you know, a half inch of snow and all of a sudden the stores are out of, you know, milk and bread, you know, which is ridiculous, but it happens. Um, so would people do that if they suddenly announce, yeah, you know, there's there are extraterrestrials here. Yeah, you'll have people running for the store, but um, I think most people would be like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> yeah, you finally said something. Good. So... Um, all right, so let me go ahead and, um, we'll set up the call in here. So if anybody wants to go ahead and call in, um, that's the number and the meeting ID. Um, you have a question, comment, whatever, um, we'll go ahead and take that, um, yeah, and Andrea Angra saying would rather panic over aliens than some deadly virus. Yeah, and that that that'll happen. You will get a panic over a virus, and I would rather have the aliens than a virus for sure. Um, yeah, and there's the loaded question from Betty Lange. Did you hear anything, Mike, when you worked for the government? Did you form an opinion then? So, yeah, I have a um, um, a video we did when it was inside the upside down before it was beyond the shadows we did a show on um what was it it was um was it government secrets and nsa or something nsa secrets basically i did give a little background to um some of the stuff from when i did work at nsa a couple of years back in the mid 90s um you know, and I can't say that I, I saw an alien. No, I did not see an alien. I did not see a UFO. Um, and given, you know, where I worked and who I was working for and all that, I had a top secret clearance. But within the government, just because you have a top secret clearance doesn't mean you have access to everything. Um, the clearances are compartmentalized. And even within those compartments, um, you have to have a need to know to be able to get to that information. So it's like... Yeah, I could see, let's put it this way, I could see stuff was there, but I couldn't see any specifics as to what that stuff was, you know, because it was just very surface level as far as what I could get into. I just, I didn't have a need to know. So, but I know, I know stuff is going on. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know any specifics. So I'm not an insider, I guess. <laughs> Um, Dave Wilkerson, do you think they would harm us? Well, you know, are they harming us now? And that's kind of a big question there. Are they harming us now? Because you hear about the different abductions in people do claim that, you know, they're doing these different tests on them and they become very traumatized. Um, so, you know, people would say they're, they're getting hurt during the abductions, you know, if these abductions are real, um, but I think there's also there might also be something to be said for well if they have been you know amongst us now for several decades if not longer, um, and it's still pretty much under wraps except for like you know they'll they'll call us conspiracy theorists and all that stuff then they can't be hurting us too much right because um, I mean really if they wanted to hurt us they really could have already done so any. Any entity, any um, life form that has been able to figure out space travel to come from some other solar system to get here would have the technology to also annihilate us, you know, um, and they haven't done that. 
Now, there are um, some ideas that they have done things to uh, to prevent us from annihilating ourselves, like disarming nuclear warheads while they're in the air. Um, there, there's some footage out there uh, that that is supposed to show this. Um, you know, and there's a lot of people that believe that that really happened. So, coinciding with, okay, you know, these saucers that we're seeing in Washington State, Roswell, um, the saucers over, um, or the lights over Washington, D.C. We didn't really get into that so much yet. Uh, yeah, the D.C. stuff, what was interesting about that, so it happened over a couple days' time, 1952, it's kind of like when the big height of all the reports were going on. Um, it's interesting. So the the way the television show is done right now, the way it's depicted, it basically has all these episodes and this research and all this stuff and then culminates with Washington, D.C., which was like really one of the very first things for Project Blue Book. All the other stuff that they kind of depicted really happened during like Project Sign and Project Grudge. Um, and Project Blue Book was really like new when the thing happened in Washington, D.C. Um, Ruppelt, who is... You know, basically the guy heading up all of this, he was in Washington, D.C. at the time that it happened, um, but he wasn't told about it for, you know, like until like the next day. And then when he tried to get access to it and like get a car to go to the sightings and all that, they like wouldn't let him have a car. So he really didn't get a lot of information while he was there in Washington, went back to Wright-Patterson and got a little bit of information while he was there. And starting with starting with that and like really into like the later 50s and 60s and all that. Um, and this is what Heineck says, after Ruppelt left, mid-50s, that the uh, Project Blue Book really became like a like a PR piece um, for, you know, these reports to the public. That is really what most of it became. Um, so with Washington, the Washington incident, uh, Ruppelt, while he was there, he didn't really have like an active part of it and became more of like the public relations team for Project Blue Book that was involved with that. So, um, so really it's like when all that began in the 40s into the 50s, um, that whole era, you had, remember, the Cold War. We came out of World War II. And we went into the Cold War, and we were doing all kinds of nuclear testing. So were the Soviets, and there was this big idea that we were going to launch into World War III and annihilate each other with nuclear weapons. So there's an idea that other beings in the universe uh, had realized, well, the Earthlings have mastered nuclear technology. They can destroy their entire planet. We don't want that to happen. And so they were doing things to try to prevent us from destroying ourselves. Which, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me. You know, if they weren't as heavily involved up until that point, of course, there's a lot of people that believe that they were heavily involved in like starting civilizations <laughs> around the globe. And then they kind of like went hands off. And then it seems like once we came up with the technology to make a nuclear weapon, oh, we're hands on again, at least to a degree. Uh, Justin Brown, I like this question. <laughs> what if aliens have destroyed us in the past, the reason why ancient civilizations fell or were lost? Very well could be. Um, so like Oppenheimer referred to uh, some of that you know, after uh, you know, he came up with the, the atomic bomb and uh, you know, he said, I'm the destroyer of, of worlds. So referencing uh, some of those old Vedic texts that, um, you know, where they, they destroyed the world back then. And there is some archaeological evidence of maybe, maybe um, something atomic happening uh, to, to wipe out some different civilizations. You know, you see the vitrified rocks and, um, you know, people basically just in place being annihilated. Um, so here's what I, what I believe about lost civilizations. Um, I mean, I think there were certainly 
uh, natural cataclysms that took out uh, a lot of these different lost civilizations. You know, these people that knew how to create these big me megalithic structures, you know, like the pyramids uh, and things like that. You know, we lost, we lost the technology. We lost the know-how of how to create these different things. And you know, so where did that go? Why did we suddenly lose it? And, you know, there's that idea that um, as different civilizations were consumed by whatever it was. Could it have been aliens? Sure. Could it have been a natural disaster that, that took them out? You know, some people talk like a comet impact, things like that. Could have been. Um, that those who had the ingenuity to be able to build those things were destroyed, and the only people that were left were the ones that knew how to survive and so that's what they did is they just survived they weren't you know half of earth is wiped out or whatever they're not looking to build you know big pyramids or whatever for the moment they're just trying to live day to day so uh very well very well could be um so Dave Wilkerson, do you think they are the reason we are so advanced? Uh, we've made a big step in the last hundred years. Uh, there's there's people that believe that um, that we've been past alien technology, and uh, that is why we are as advanced right now. That some of the things that um, that we didn't necessarily come up with on our own, that it was given to us, and so we're getting piecemealed some of this different technology. Um, but it makes you wonder about some things. It's like, okay, so if we're, if we're getting some of this technology from them to be able to advance in some areas, you know, like computing or whatever, you know, why not in other ways? Why are we still, um, you know, why are we still using the, uh, you know, combustible engine in a car? I mean, yeah, we have the electric ones and stuff like that, but it's like we we haven't we haven't progressed in some areas. Um, where you think we would. So, um, you know, and, and that could just be our dependence on oil, which we shouldn't be dependent on oil anymore, but yet we are, and somehow we haven't made progress in that, and that could just be a greedy money thing, which should probably in a lot of ways it is. Um... Victoria Monday, reverse engineering, huge leaps in technology shortly after Roswell. Well, yeah, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of people that talk about you know reverse engineering from a spacecraft that has crashed here on Earth. That's um, that's what Bob Lazar talks about. Is that he was working on a project that was reverse engineering uh, alien technology that he was working on the propulsion system to be able to learn how to do that. And so that could be where something that's coming from as well. So, Andrew Helen, do you think our advancements are because of extraterrestrial or just unlimited resources? I do know the government is much more advanced than the public sector is aware of. In some areas, in some areas, you know, it's it's funny. It's really funny um, with the government. Yeah, they have like some really interesting um, toys. <laughs> They're very highly advanced. And yet, when it comes to, oh, I don't know, just building a nice website, they can't freaking seem to manage it, you know? <laughs> it's like, you go to any government website, and it's like just a big clusterfuck. And it looks bad. It looks like something out of 1996. Um, most of them, in any case. And it's like, really? You know, you guys have, like, all these space-age toys that you're dealing with, and you can't even build, like, a nice UI for a website. You know, so some of it is just kind of... Um, and in, in having spent some some time in the military, it's um, you know some areas are very just very rigid, very bland, very basic, you know. And then yet you have these other like crazy, uh, highly technologically advanced uh, toys, for lack of a better term. So it's it's like feast or famine <laughs> when it comes to the government. You know, and it probably has to do with the the funding that they put into different areas and some of the different personnel that they bring in. I mean, I mean, honestly, um, you know, there's for an individual 
Um, there's a lot more money to be made in the private sector for an individual. Now, if you're a, um, you know, a government contractor, then you can, uh, you know, make all your money that way. Uh, but if you're just like someone, um, you know, just like in the military or whatever, um, and you're getting peanuts, you know, it's just, it's just really, it's really intriguing the way all that kind of works and pans out. Okay, Dave Wilkerson, Mike, do you think the men in black are still out there protecting? So, the men in black, um, yeah, these are these are kind of creepy guys. You know, some of some people believe that they're actually interdimensional beings that they're not actually government officials. Um, of course, there's the the movies and that kind of play off of uh, you know some of that stuff. But um, so the Men in Black are seemingly like an organization that is outside of the government. That's almost kind of like a um, interplanetary oversight. So they're aware of um, these different extraterrestrial interactions, and they come to kind of almost like clean up the mess they're there to kind of set things in order and make things make sure things go the right way and people are talking and saying the right thing um you know and it's still questionable as to whether or not they really exist but um you know because you see some of the footage and it's like well that could just be a couple of guys walking into a building you know but they kind of look exactly the same you know, sure, it could be a couple of bald guys with hats and trench coats walking into a building together, you know. Um, so it's another one of those things that do they, don't they exist? We don't know. Um, but the possibility out there that um, that they do, and they, they kind of basically, the show that we're talking about earlier, Project Blue Book, they basically are depicting uh, the one the one set of guys as the men in black because uh, they kind of get surrounded by them there for for a moment. Um, but they do seem to work outside uh, of the actual government. And uh, yeah, so in some ways, I believe that they exist, I suppose. Shadow people is men in black. No, they're separate. Um, yeah, men in black are humans or at least seemingly human um you know because we look at black eyed children and it's like well they look human but they're not <laughs> you just you just know they're not um but i believe that those are interdimensional beings but not they're not shadow people um shadow people are just basically black devoid of any uh features i think people try to relate men in black to shadow people because they think of the hat man shadow person and the hat man is just one type of shadow person there's many types of shadow people well also with the hat man you don't see any features he's still all black he's just a shadow that has what looks like he's wearing a hat looks like he's wearing a trench coat but it's all kind of like the outline of it like if I'm wearing a trench coat right now. If I was to put a hat on, stand out in the sun and see my shadow on the ground, you could see the outline of, you know, there's, oh yeah, there's there's a person wearing a trench coat and he's wearing the hat. And if you just kind of like stood that upright, then that would be your hat man shadow person. Uh, men in black, I mean, they they look human. You know, they, I mean, they have a, a white face, right? <laughs> um, or, you know, I, I guess... Um, with the men in black that have been seen, you know, I don't want to get, you know, get into race or anything here. That doesn't, um, but um, the men in black that have been seen, they're white, they're bald, they're wearing a hat, um, you know, but they're not shadow people. Uh, could they be interdimensional beings from some other planet? Maybe. I mean, you know, who knows? Maybe they're a time traveler or something like that. And, you know, coming from a future of ours, you know, to knowing that, you um, that we're doing things today that could, you know, that, well, of course, anything that we do today is going to have an effect on the future, but maybe they know of things that, you know, people are doing or, you know, having a moment that they need to interject and get involved with. I mean, that could always be, but they, they definitely look human. They're not shadows. And yes, Nick Moulet, <laughs> men in black do wear black. 
Um, Shannon Grogan, we have a shadow man here in the house. Um, we could take that offline. Um, we covered shadow people last week, but of course I just came out with my book, A Walk in the Shadows, A Complete Guide to Shadow People, which is all about that. Um, so you can uh, hit me up offline. Um, I say basically offline from uh, this show tonight. So just like message me or whatever, and we can uh, we can discuss that. Um, <laughs> Andrea Anger saying, "Am I going to go see Motley Crue this summer?" <laughs> don't know, don't know yet. Um, you think I would, right? Um, from Robert Hanna, do I? Oh, okay. One one last minute black question from uh, Victoria Monday. Do they have facial features? Yes, they do. Which is why I say they're not uh, shadow people. They do have facial features. They look just like a human being. Um, and the thing is, is that the ones that have been seen just tend to all look the same. So, but they do have facial features. Um, okay, so Ingrid Cold was real. So he's been seen apparently a couple different times. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know if Ingrid Cole is, um, just made up and it would have to be made up by a couple different people. Um, but anybody can hear a story from, you know, one time and decide to play along with it. So I think that is probably going to wrap it up guys. Um, I mean, it's a little bit of a shorter, I mean, 50 minutes, we usually go an hour, right? But, um, I'll take any last questions down there if you guys have them and we'll go ahead and start to wrap it up because I think I pretty much hit on all of my um, all the topics I wanted to hit on. I, I, think, I think it's an interesting show just to get back to Project Blue Book specifically real quick. Um, I do think it's an interesting show that um, obviously a lot of it's dramatized, a lot of it's fictionalized. Um, the cases are, they're based on the cases from back then. Um, some of them, they've changed uh, the locations. They've changed most, if not all, of the names involved. Um, they give you an idea of, you know, the types of things that they did back then. And I think any show like this, what it serves is as a way to get you interested in the topic and then you can go forth and do your own research for yourself and see what the real truth is, um, which is kind of, you know, kind of what I've done here is I've gone back, okay, you know, who exactly was Heineck? You know, who were the people that were involved with, with Project Blue Book primarily? And, uh, you know, what did they actually do? You know, you know Heineck himself, um, you know, it, it kind of has him as the main guy on the show, and it's like him and Quinn and, and they are basically Project Blue Book. And it was like, well, it was actually a little bit, a bit bigger of an organization. And it's, it's interesting going through Hynek's work that, um, you know, he would, he would give his feedback into the report. He wasn't the one like actually generating the report. So from his perspective, it's like, you know, this is the information that I gave Project Blue Book. But as to whether or not they use that in their report, they may or may not have. There were times that he would give information that would just get ignored. It wouldn't end up in the report, um, which was kind of one of his you know, frustrations with it was, hey, you know, he has information. This person over there has information and it's not making it into the reports. And then they end up dismissing the report, um, you know, as like, I don't know, like a hoax or whatever, whatever they thought it, it may have been or, um, you know, a light inversion or, or what have you, you know, something physical or psychological with the person. You know, they had a lot of different categories that they would throw it into and this is, boom, close the case. I mean, there are many. Um, it, it's not like every sighting ended up on the desk of Project Blue Book. There are many that would get called in uh, to the Air Force and the Air Force would just immediately, boom, you know, close it, they'd be like, oh yeah, that was just, you know, whatever, that was just light refracting off of Venus or whatever, and then boom, they would close it, it would never end up with Project Blue Book, so you think of, you know, almost 13,000 reports that came out of there, and there were many more that never even made it to, to Project Blue Book, that they never even saw, so there was a lot more going on during that time. 
So when did the public find out about Project Blue Book? That's from Betty Lange. Um I mean, they knew about it. I mean, it was it wasn't classified. Um, you know, it's it's been public for a long, long time, uh, and they knew about it back then. Um, you know, like I was saying earlier, with Washington D.C., uh, there were representatives from uh, Project Blue Book, like they're they're like little press secretary and all that stuff, um, that you know, spoke in Washington, D.C. about, you know, what Project Blue Book had, you know, was working on in, in regards to that particular incident and all that. So, yeah, the public knew. The thing is, is that there's so many reports and you can, you can access it all, um, but it's, what is it? It's like over 70,000 pages and um, however many photos and, and all that stuff. Um you can't just like walk in someplace and say, hey, can I have the blue book? It's it's not like that. It's not a book. I mean, it was just the name of the project. And I guess they called it that because um, they were referencing um, college exams because that's kind of the way they felt it was in the beginning. So, um, yeah, you can't just walk in and say, hey, can I have the blue book? It, no. Um, th there are places to get it all, um, but it's a lot of paper, microfiche, stuff like that that you're going through um, to, to be able to access it and review it. And many people have. They've actually painstakingly gone through it because they want to know what those, especially the 700 unidentified, they want to know uh, what those are. So Shannon Grogan, did I miss the medium? Yeah, we had her on um, Edge of the Rabbit Hole. That was on our YouTube channel. Well, one of our YouTube channels. We have the Hunter Road Media YouTube channel and then we have the Edge of the Rabbit Hole YouTube channel. She was on Edge of the Rabbit Hole uh, earlier this evening, so you can go back and watch the replay of that because that's that's up on uh, the Edge of the Rabbit Hole YouTube channel right now. That was Nicole Guillaume with uh, with the chakras. So uh, Robert believes that they lied when they said Project Blue Book ended. Well, th that itself, Project Blue Book itself, did end. Now, if there's something else going on um, in the government, in the military, that they are they're still doing that. I believe so. Um, like, I mean, one that one, one that everybody knows about SETI. Um, you know, that's one where they're looking for extraterrestrial life um, throughout the universe. Um, so it would make sense to me that they also have one for here on Earth. <laughs> they're looking for extraterrestrial life that may be amongst us. Um, that would be. A defensive measure so just you know just just from that viewpoint you know if extraterrestrials have come here from a defensive measure it would make sense that we would still be looking here on our own planet you know so all right everybody let's go ahead and uh wrap it up here